Good morning. The night before his death, Jesus was trying to give some frightened followers of his some handles for grabbing on hold of life. And, and in the midst of it, he said simply, just hang on to me. Stay connected to all that I am, all that I was, all that I will be. And for the kind of life that you have ahead of you, you don't need a guidebook or a map. You just need to be with me. That's Jesus' words to his disciples on the last night of his, the last night before he went to the crucifixion. Uh, I invite you to stand up in the room. And I want you to, uh, to join us for the call to worship. The words that I just shared, we're going to be getting into that a little bit about Jesus' love, about being connected to the, to the vine. And so as we, as we lead into our worship service, let's do our call to worship responsively. The words are up on the screen. Hear, O people, Jesus chose you and calls you friend. Jesus made a home among us to show us how to love. Jesus invites us to come to the table to know the joy that comes when we love one another the way God loves us. Beloved in Christ, Jesus welcomes you home. We want to make our home with God and one another, bound together by love and enlivened by joy. Amen. Let's join in singing, Come Christians, Join to Sing. The words are up on the screen. It's in the hymnal number 158 if you want to look at the music as well. But otherwise, join us in following. Cheryl will lead us out. If I should say, oh, I, there are some new folks here. You should go around and meet one another. But we're not going to do that right now. We'll take some time afterwards. In fact, we invite you all to stay because we've got um, not just our regular fellowship time, which we have every week, but we're going to stay longer and have a, a whole Italian dinner. Um, it's 
kind of close. It, well, it is Cinco de Mayo, but we're not having a Mexican dinner. We're having an Italian dinner. So wrap your brains around that. But that's how we're going to be doing it today. And, uh, and that's to celebrate and to help uh, do a little bit of fundraising for Lily's uh, trip to Italy this summer. I think it's this summer, right? Yeah. And so anyway, join us to eat and make sure that you meet some, meet, see some old friends, meet some new friends as we join. I think we've got enough bulletins now to go around. So if you need to follow that, most of the service is up on the screen. It's um, the first Sunday of the month. Happy May, everybody. First Sunday of the month, we celebrate the Lord's table or communion or the Eucharist. Um, in the United Methodist Church, it's open. We celebrate being an open church and inviting all to the table because actually the communion table, it's something that Jesus set up and he said, come to the table. And so we invite all people. You don't have to be part of this church. You don't have to be United Methodist. Just um, have a desire to come and maybe encounter, have an experience with the divine. And so that's what we'll be doing a little bit later in the service. But for now, with the beginning, um, I'd like to open with a word of prayer. Gracious creator, we who so often take the wonders of creation for granted, we welcome the opportunity to make a joyful noise before you, O God. We come here this morning to worship and to praise you. But joyful noises are not always easy for everyone to make. Some are burdened down with the stresses of daily living. Some are wearied from the tasks of serving others. Others are worried over the state of the world. Some live in want and fear. Speak to us, O oh God. In the stillness of this time, and remind us of Jesus, of Jesus' willingness to take our burdens upon himself. Teach us to learn from him, to experience his gentleness and steadfast love for all and especially to know his joy, that our joy might be complete. We offer this time of worship to you, O God, praying that it may reflect our praise and thanksgiving for the gifts of creation and for all that Jesus has done for us. This we pray in his name. Amen. Today's one of those days... Um, that as you're outside with the breezes and the sunshine and, and this morning, though the sun was out, there was a, a mist in the river valley and it's not hard to enjoy the wonders of creation. And so one of the ways that we, um, we, try, to, we try to respond in some ways and one of the ways that ancient people Ancient Hebrews responded as they wrote poems about it. And some of those poems are collected in our scriptures. And one of them is here before us. It's Psalm 98. We're going to read this responsively. So let's join in reading this poem together. Oh, sing to the Lord a new song. For the Lord has done marvelous things. God's right hand and holy arm have gotten the victory. The Lord has remembered his steadfast love and faithfulness to the house of Israel. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Sing praises to the Lord with the lyre and the lyre and the sound of melody. Make a joyful noise before the ruler of the Lord. Let the sea roar and all that fills it, the world and those who dwell in it. The Lord will judge the earth with righteousness and the peoples with equity. Righteousness and equity, justice and peace and fairness for all. We're going to look into our scripture. There are a couple of scriptures this morning that are going to lead us into reflecting on, on our message, on the text. And so the first comes from the epistle. The first epistle is 
I use that because it's a good churchy language. The first letter of John that he wrote in the back of our Bible, 1 John chapter 4. We, last week we looked at part of this. We're going to look at some of the same piece and go into a little bit more. Dear friends, John writes, let us love each other because love is from God. And everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. The person who doesn't love does not know God because God is love. This is how the love of God is revealed to us. God has sent his only son into the world so that we can live through him. This is love. It is not that we love God, but that God loved us and sent his son as a sacrifice that deals with our sins. Dear friends, if God loved us in this way, we really ought to love each other. I added the really in there, but that's... Um, we really ought to love each other. No one has ever seen God. But if we love each other, God remains in us. and God's love is made perfect in us. And then I want to go to our gospel reading that comes from the gospel of John. Chapter 15, and I'm reading a couple of verses that lead us into, into the more significant part. I am the vine and you are the branches. Jesus is speaking to his friends in an upper room. If you remain in me and I in you, then you will produce much fruit. Without me, you can't do anything. My Father is glorified when you produce much fruit. And in this way, prove that you are my disciples. As the Father loved me, I too have loved you. So remain in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will remain in my love, just as I kept my Father's commandments and remain in his love. I've said these things to you so that my joy will be in you and your joy will be complete. This is my commandment. Love each other just as I have loved you. No one has greater love than to give up one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. Now, I don't call you servants anymore because servants don't know what their master is doing. Instead, I call you friends because everything I heard from my father I've made known to you. You didn't choose me, but I chose you and appointed you so that you could go and produce fruit and so that your fruit could last. As a result, whatever you ask the Father in my name, he will give you. I give you these commandments so that you can love each other. May God bless the hearing and understanding of this portion of scripture. If you've watched a commercial if you've ever seen a commercial for a new medicine on television there is one thing that really sticks with you and more and more it's been sticking with me and it's probably true for all of us and that is the product warning that takes up significant part of those commercials so you you notice those Half of the commercial is all of those things, the the possible problems that could arise from taking this medication and and the possible problems seem to be way worse than whatever you're taking it for. I mean, when we get those medicines, when we order them and they they come in the mail or we pick them up at the pharmacy, often we'll get pages of additional warnings about this medication. But that's not, that's not the only thing. I mean, when we purchase anything, pretty much any household product, there are warnings involved. So much so, a couple of friends of mine a, a number of years book back wrote a book on it, the warning label book, they called it. <laughs> warning labels are everywhere, and, and some of them are a little out there. I mean, when you read some of them posted on the products, you, have you ever thought, Who did what in order that we have to be warned against that in that particular way? I mean, there's a fold-up stroller that said, caution, remove infant before folding for storage. (laughs) Or, Or a clothes iron that has the label, do not iron clothes on body. I'm trying to picture someone trying to do that. Um... There was, do not use near fire, flame, or sparks. That was on a fireplace lighter. 
or caution, hot beverages are hot on a coffee cup, right? It's good to be remembered of that, reminded of that. Um, there, there's, um, there are warnings on microwaves that say, do not use for drying pets. Yeah, which good advice. And, and I, I read one that was on a case of hammers, may be harmful if swallowed. Uh, hammers, yeah. Yeah, a case of them. And whoever tried to swallow a hammer, I just don't want to think about that. So, so you think, okay, these labels, how dumb do they think we are, right? And yet, it might be good to remember that there's plenty of evidence that human beings often seem to struggle with common sense or with distraction or sometimes just plain incompetence. Um, uh, there's a funny meme that's been going around on the internet, and it's just a reminder about professional problems. The, the meme is, you had one job, uh, one job, and there are all these pictures of professional failures, uh, doors in midair, and, uh, and stairs that go to nowhere. They miss the door, apparently, with this store, stairway. Um, or uh, there, uh, there's a stairway that got close to the door, didn't quite get there. Yeah, there's, um, oh yeah. I, I hope you can see the problem with this one. A lot of signs that somehow don't, here, here's one, a good stack of pallets to say. Yeah, so, and uh, can you see that one clearly? Someone wasn't paying attention, I think, or is really confused. Um, and, and you get this one. <laughs> yeah, the red, white, and blue usually doesn't come in, in uh, St. Andrew's Cross, Eric, so. Um, and, yeah, I mean, I can understand this happening. But there are all kinds of these memes. One job, sometimes it seems a bit crazy, that Jesus actually entrusted to him human beings with his mission, doesn't it? You go, wait, what? But he did. And he did, he pretty much did it that way. He gave us one job. And he said it in a few different ways at a few different times. He said, a new commandment I give to you is that you love one another. Or something like, love the Lord with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength without holding anything back. And love your neighbor as yourself. He said, these are the only commandments in the Bible that are really worth anything. All the rest is commentary. That's, he said that in not quite so many words, but he said, these are the two commandments that are at the heart of everything I'm teaching and everything that the Bible has to say. The rest of it are ways in which we can help to live that out. It really comes down to that. We have one job. In John 15... Jesus is trying to share some final teaching with his disciples, and he very clearly tells us that as branches are connected to a vine, it's like to a grapevine, they're all familiar. There are grapes being grown all over the place. As branches are connected to the vine, we need to be connected to the vine if we're going to bear fruit. I'm the vine, he says. You are the branches. Remain in me, abide in me, stay connected to me, and you'll bear much fruit. Without that, without staying connected, you won't. You can't. Most of us have heard that before, and we get the idea about staying connected to the Lord. And even though it's kind of early in the season when we start thinking about our gardens and about producing fruit or vegetables, you know, we realize that certain things have to be connected to other things in order for them to work. Um, even if you're not real good at growing things, you've got to realize that you've got to connect the hose to the faucet and that if you want to get water out the end of it. You know, vines need to be connected. It needs to stay connected to the roots and all of that. Producing and bearing fruit, well, that's what our gardens are about. So most of us have heard that phrase to bear fruit, and we may think that we know what it means. Some aren't too sure. Some really have no idea what it means when we encounter it in the Bible. 
But wherever we stand on that, it's a good idea to stop and think for a minute. Wait, what, what does it mean for a Christian, for a Jesus follower, to bear fruit? I mean, Jesus is talking here about, like, that's something that we're going to want to do. He sort of takes it for granted that that's the plan, is that we're going to do that. And so how do we do that? Well, the first thing is that we need to stay connected. And he continues this discourse. And, and actually, this section of John is sometimes called the farewell discourse because it's a, a fairly long section with some teaching to his disciples the night that he's saying goodbye to them. They don't quite realize that he's saying goodbye to them, but there's a lot of important teaching he's sharing with them because in just a few hours, he's going to be in the Garden of Gethsemane. He's going to be getting betrayed and arrested and taken to torture and ultimately to crucifixion. And he knows that's all coming up. There are important things. He wants to get off his chest with his disciples, with his closest friends, with his followers. Because they're about to go through a mess. And so he's trying to encourage them. He's trying to give them hope. He's trying to give them direction as they go forward. So foundationally to that planning, foundational to that farewell discourse is that section, stay connected to all that I was, all that I am, all that I will be. Remember my example. Sense my ongoing presence with you. That's what Jesus was trying to get through to these uncertain and frightened. Some of them were, were a little bit frightened already because he'd been talking in ways that they, they didn't quite understand. They were about to go through something they hadn't really planned on. So there's a lot that Jesus had to share for them. And, and he talks about being chosen and called, and he talks about obedience, about keeping my commandments, and he talks about sacrifice. No greater love is anyone than to lay down his life for his friends. And he talks about love a lot. Perhaps in the business of bearing fruit, that's the one job, love. John certainly seemed to think so when he got around to writing that letter that we called 1 John. The whole thing is about love. If you read through it, it's not a very long book, but you'll find every chapter has sort of the theme of how we should love one another, how God is love, how we can't really know God if we don't understand love, if we don't get, you know, if we don't try to practice it, try to wrestle it, try to love one another. And, and John is going through four chapters before he gets to this particular passage where he says, let's love one another because love is from God. And everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. God is love, he says, and we know it through Jesus. So that certainly puts love right at the heart of this discourse. Now, the, Paul, the Apostle Paul, a number of years later, got into this conversation about fruit a little bit too. In, the, in Paul's letter to the Galatian church, he, he talks about the fruit of the Spirit. You've heard that phrase as well. And we're going to dig into that this summer. You get that little fruit of the Spirit, dig garden city. That's the summer. We'll dig a little bit. We're going to dig into the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. I could rattle them all off because I've got them written right here in front of me. Um, but maybe by the end of the summer, we'll all be able to rattle them off and understand a little bit about them, about what fruit is. It's something that we produce. But you notice the first of that list that Paul gives us is love. Love is a fruit. It's something that is produced when we stay connected to the divine because the divine is love. And how do we know it? We can experience directly through Jesus. Love. And here's something that's really interesting because it goes, the fruit of the Spirit, as Paul listed, is love, joy. Joy is the second one. And interestingly enough, right in the middle of this little section of Jesus talking is he starts talking about joy. He brings it up right in the middle. He says that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. 
I've said these things so that you, that, so that my joy will be in you and your joy. That's why he's telling them joy. It's one of those kind of elusive qualities when we think about it. That we think, well, a joy, that's like happiness or being merry. Or is it? Or is there more to it than that? Sometimes it seems that joy is deeper than that. that and the Bible suggests that maybe it is. We try to picture joy. A lot of times we picture a movement, jumping or dancing or running and, and jumping for joy. We talk about it. It's, it's like when joy hits us, we can't be still. There's movement and there's some sense that you can't keep joy in, that, that you can't keep it to yourself, that somehow it involves other people. Just a little echo back, you notice, love involves other people too. It might help us understand a little bit what Jesus said, that my joy may be in you and your joy might be full. He's saying that our joy may be fleeting, but that it fills us up, but that it's not complete until it's joined with joy that comes from the divine. A joy that knows that there's no greater love than to lay down one's life for a friend. Our joy is complete, or, or other words are mature or perfect. In fact, that's all the same word in Greek. Teleos. Complete, mature, perfect. So sometimes when we find those talking about that, you know, may your love be perfect, may your love be grown up, may it be complete, and you only find that when you're connected, well, back to connected again, to the divine. Because there's a joy that comes from eternity that is greater than, than the momentary joy that we might have because of circumstances or, or particular moments in our life. Joy is fleeting when we attempt to generate it from ourselves. We can sustain it, can sustain it for only so long. But, but when we abide in him, when we remain in him, as branches of the vine remain in the vine, then Jesus talks about rivers of living water that flow from the heart, a never-ending source, an overwhelming joy. Eternal joy is a gift that comes from Jesus, from abiding in Jesus. And he says that to abide in him is to obey his commandment, to love one another as he loved us, to love as he loves and it's to look outward. And joy is found not in the contentment of satisfying our own desires, but in service to those we love as he loves. It's in acts of service. It's in healing and in helping. It is in holding shaky hands and calming troubled hearts. It's in honoring those that we love. It's in reaching out in love and giving yourself over to loving, even when it costs something to do so. You know, joy, like love, is really something that you give, a, give it away. And that, that reminded me of a, of a little kid's folk song that I... You might, you might have heard this, this song, just a little simple. Love is something if you give it away, give it away, give it away. Love is something if you give it away, you end up having more. It's just like a magic penny, hold it on and you won't have any. Lend it, spend it, and you have so many, the roll all over the floor. Love is something if you give it away, give it away, give it away. Love is something if you give it away, you end up having more. You know, love is something if you give it away, you end up having more. Because you know what? Love isn't even love if you're not giving it away. And that's where we find joy. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for your love. Thank you, love, the Lord, that, that in your love, our love may be made more, 
full, more complete, um, and, and touch more and more people. So we pray, Lord, that that will be our desire, that we will take that as our one job. The one thing that we really want to pursue is to be like you because of our love. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. in singing this God bless to us our bread. The words are up on the screen. God bless to us our bread and give bread to all those who are hungry and hunger for justice to those who are fed. God bless to us We want to take a little bit of time to pray together and to lift up loved ones and friends and our community and any awareness that we might have of, uh, of needs in our world. Our prayers are prayers of thanksgiving and praise, but they're prayers of intercession as well for those who may need um, God's particular blessing today. And, uh, and so there is a prayer list in our bulletin. Um, I think this one might be um, might be at the end of the of the bulletin or um, somewhere in there we stick that in. I think it's on the back page, uh, just inside the back cover. Some of the things we were already aware of, and I invite you to keep that and, and pray through the week about those um, those who may touch your heart, but some of those on on this list as well. But we're going to join in prayer. And then, um, and then we're going to lift up, um, I'll say something, Lord, in your love, and we'll all affirm that prayer. I mean, you can speak out in the, in the congregation and invite you to lift up your prayers, and we'll all join in by saying, hear this, our prayer. Uh, let's join in prayer. Our gracious God, thank you for prayer. Thank you for the group that gets to gather this morning. Thank you for the celebration of the Lord's table. Thank you for the beautiful weather that made it just pleasant to come out and make our way to, to the fellowship this morning. Thank you for the fellowship that is ahead of us and the chance to share a meal together with laughter and joy and good food. Thank you for so many things. And thank you that we could just talk to you like kids talking to a beloved parent. 
And so we do want to lift up our needs, our concerns, our worries, our fears, and we want to lift up our loved ones. And so this morning, hear, hear us as we share what is on our hearts. Are there prayers that we should, that we should lift? So Sandra, Sandra, prayers for Sandra. Her husband passed away? Her, okay, Sandra in Washington. Lord, in your love. So for Brenda and Jeff, as they're going through some changes, and Jeff in a nursing home, yes, Lord, in your love. Amen. Everyday miracles. Yes. So, Lord, thank you for uh, somehow warnings that, that guide our lives. Lord, in your love. Oh, Mark. Okay, so Carol, who's online, because people online sometimes call in their prayers as well. Carol is praying, asking for prayer for Mary, um, and who's dealing with so many things with her, with a husband who has special need. And so, oh, Lord, for, for Mary this morning, Lord, in your love. So for the people in Oklahoma, sulfur, sulfur, and other communities hit by tornadoes this past week. There have been some devastation, and it's earlier than normal. Um, Lord, in your love. Your grandpa's having hip surgery. Okay. So for grandpa and the hip surgery, is it that this week? It's coming up soon? A couple of weeks? Okay. So for our, that, for grandpa with hip surgery, Lord, in your love. Ah. Lord, for Fern's back pain, Yes, um, we're not praying for the pain. We're pay, praying that it'll go away, Lord. Lord, in your love. Lord, these are just a few of the things. There are more on our hearts. Um, there's more that we want to lift up. We want to lift up our community. We want to lift up the challenges that we face here. We want to lift up our church and we want to lift up our denomination. We give you thanks for the, the wonderful spirit of our general conference and, uh, and the blessings that have 
are coming out of that. We want to lift up to you the tensions and the challenges in our world. It's hard to escape them. It's hard to escape um, hearing about them, and that can make us anxious. We pray, Lord, for hope and for peace in you. Um, peace in our hearts, even as we're motivated to work for justice and for grace and for peace for all people. So, Lord, we, we lift up our world and we pray that you will work in us, in our hearts, in our, in our lives, that what we say and what we do and our actions and who we are, all of that is a reflection of your grace and love. We pray all of this in Jesus' name as we pray together the prayer that he taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. As we prepare for communion, let's join in singing All Who Hunger. The words are up on the screen as we sing. And see the grace eternal taste And see that God is good All who hunger never stranger Seeker be a welcome guest Come from restless and grow We rejoice, we keep the peace We about involving all of our beings in worship. And sometimes in a, in a world where it's driven so much by what we can read, what we can see, um, we forget that God impacts us. Uh, you want me to wear that over here? Thank you. I walked away from the mic, so you can hear me online. Sorry, folks. Um, they missed out. So... Uh, there is a way in which we can all participate with our full being. All of our senses engage as we hear, as we see. In the Eucharist, we taste and we feel um, as we engage with the divine. Christ our Lord invites to his table all who love him, who earnestly repent of their sin and seek to live in peace with one another. Therefore, let us confess our sin before God 
and one another. The words are up on the screen. Join me as we make this confession together. Almighty God, you love us, but we have not loved you. You call, but we have not listened. We walk away from neighbors in need, wrapped up in our own concerns. We have gone along with evil, with pride, quarreling, and divisiveness. Holy God, help us to face up to ourselves so that as you move toward us in mercy, we may repent, turn to you, and receive mercy. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. So, here are the good news. God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever turns to him will never perish. Jesus didn't come to condemn us, but that we might have life. And that proves God's love toward us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory to God. Amen. And so I want to take a moment just to direct that, um, to give thanks for the gifts that we have received. And in particular, I'm speaking for this particular church fellowship. Um, thank you, you folks who are generous and faithful to help support the ministry of our church through through gifts that are sent in the mail, through checks, through electronic giving. We don't pass an offering plate, but we do have boxes at the back of the church and, at the, and an offering plate at the front that you can drop off an offering while you're here. And so what I want to pause to do is to take a moment to dedicate these gifts for the work of God and that, that we will be accountable in responsiveness to God. So can we pray this together? God of joy, we offer our gifts this day as we reflect on the wisdom of your word. Jesus urges us to hold on to him, to stay connected to his example, presence, and the fulfillment he brings. He reveals that our joy finds completeness when it is woven into his divine joy. Help us to abide in him through love, obeying his commandment to love one another in acts of service, healing, and selfless generosity. May our joy be sustained, a shared and everlasting gift from the source of all joy. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So as we go on, the Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a and a good and a joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you. God of vision, creator of all things, heaven and earth, land and sea, light and darkness. You formed us in your image and breathed into us the breath of life. You made us for love and joy and for fellowship. When we failed at that, you stubbornly refused to give up on us. And so it's with your people on earth and all the company of heaven that we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. You continue to reveal your love in your child Jesus who came to live among us as a human being on this earth. So when dining with friends, just before his ordeal, Jesus reminded them of your love revealed in the gift of bread and juice before them on the table. He took the bread and he broke it, giving thanks to you. And then he shared it with these friends of his, saying, well, saying the words that we're so familiar with. Take and eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do it in remembrance of me. A little bit later on, when the supper was over, he took the cup 
And again, he gave thanks to you, Lord. And he shared it with his friends. All who were gathered there, reminding them, drink from this, all of you, for this is the cup of my covenant with you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so, together, we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here, Lord, and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. By your spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world. Amen. I'm going to invite you to come forward down the center aisle. You can come up to the front. Donna's going to come up and help me serve. And, uh, and invite you to take a piece of bread and to take a cup. You can stop at the communion rail and kneel or stand there if you want to. Um, you can leave your cup there when you're done. Or you can take it back to your seat with you, if, with you if you want to. And just sit there and pray for a moment as, as we serve everyone. Um, invite you to come and take it. We have a gluten-free option um, for bread for those of you who have, have gluten allergies and, and issues with that. Um, we do not have alcoholic wine, for those of you who really want that. <laughs> for those of you who prefer to be alcohol-free, you're in luck, because that is the way that we, um, that we serve our, our um, communion wine, is non-alcoholic. So we invite you to come forward and, uh, and join us for, um, for communion. Right. The table is ready. Come to the table. Come right down here. Hi, Lee. Oh, okay. You can come back here first. <laughs> Baking the gift first before he comes for communion. So, as Jesus blood shed for us. Yep, you could just come right over here, guys. Jesus' blood shed for us.
Yep, dip it right in there. There we go. doing that song. <laughs> it's called The Magic Penny. The Magic Penny. Yeah. The song that I did in the message. Hey, um, we're going to join in praying together and the words magically are up there on the screen so that we can all share together in this prayer after receiving communion. Creative God, we thank you for revealing your love to us in bread and juice. We recognize your presence in us and all around us. And we ask that you continue to reveal your love for all creation to the ends of the earth through our lives. Make us your people and use us to reveal the inbreaking of your kingdom here and now, a world of justice and peace. Amen. Thank you for joining in communion. Thank you. Um, it's kind of fun to run out. <laughs> just because there are so, so many here to share in that, that we didn't plan. Hey, just a few announcements. The first one is the first thing to happen. As soon as we sing a song following our benediction, um, we're all expected to be over there. You've been smelling the garlic bread all morning. That's what you've been smelling. It's not your neighbor. Um, and, and we're going to go over and, and share in the joy of fellowship with that and also, um, also help support. I think there's a dish over there where you can help, uh, help support Lily and her trip this summer. You can stand up, Lily, and wave at her because, you know, some... So, because she looks like such a good Italian. Um, <laughs> um, anyway, it's, um, we're going to do that after church and celebrate together. Um, other kinds of things, you know, we talked about. I always talk about it, and then I lose it. Oh, the bulletin. It's full of all kinds of things that are going on this week right inside the cover. It tells us that we have a trustees meeting this week and a church council meeting this week and the sewing group is meeting this week and it tells us that on Saturday you're supposed to come over here and do a spring cleaning at the church. We have um, a lot of fellowship and fun and we do work in the yard and work in the building 
And sometimes we even go down to the parsonage and do a little bit of work over there. And so those are, that's coming up on Saturday this week. So there are all of these things to remind us in the bulletin. And um, a few things to remind you, the, the UWF had a meeting last week and had a great celebration of collecting some of the recyclables. But it's such a good thing to do that we're not going to quit doing it. So over by the mission table, you can still leave your old clean holy socks or single socks and all that. We're still collecting socks and those items. You can see about that in the, in the bulletin. There's a reminder that the Companions in Christ group will be meeting starting in June. Is that it, Richard? The first, the first Sunday in June. The first Sunday. Yeah, so the first Sunday of June, the group will be meeting, and so you still have plenty of time to, to join it, so you can talk to Richard about it. Uh, I think that's, no, it's not nearly enough, because... Oh, I had her stand up. They already, they got to her, tell her, you have to talk. <laughs> In June um, 16th, I leave for Italy. I'll put this closer to you. Um, and we're coming back the 24th, so I'll be there for nine days. And I think the when we leave, we're having a stopover in Toronto, Canada. And so we get to go to two places. Yeah. And we're going to multiple museums. And a really old church. I don't know what it's called, but yeah. So and we're going to Rome too, so. So we'll expect a report. Yeah. <laughs> I don't remember everything fully, but yeah. <laughs> That's right. Yes. Yeah, full slides and PowerPoint and all of that. Um, <laughs> so um, all of that is going on. Um, I mentioned it earlier, I do want to share that there is some big news. Um, the United Methodist General Conference just completed its work and delegates from all over the place, including, I don't know how many people came from Wisconsin, um, went to North Carolina for the General Conference. And um, there were a number of Wisconsinites who were also working. There were. We had six delegates. There were three who were lay, three who were clergy. There were a number of alternate delegates, people who were part of it, and, um, and people who were observers because it was a pretty big uh, um, global. It's, the general conference, in case you're not familiar with it, it, it's supposed to happen every four years, but because of COVID, our last one happened eight years ago. So there were things, a lot of things that we needed to do. And every four years, they decide the direction of the United Methodist Church around the world. And so there were a couple of big things that happened in the last couple of weeks. And um, I've got a letter I'm going to read from our district superintendent who, who is just sharing a few things. Grace and peace to you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. As you know, the General Conference of the United Methodist Church has made significant changes to the Book of Discipline. That's kind of like our bylaws, the ways that United Methodist Churches operate in the Book of Discipline. This letter aims to provide clarity and encourage unity as you may engage in conversation or prepare um, or think about it. Restrictions on ministry with and by LGBTQ individuals have been removed. This historic policy change was followed by the elimination of the harmful words incompatible with Christian teaching in describing homosexuality. These decisions restore a state of neutrality by removing the restrictive language without introducing any new language that Im might imply promotion, thus ensuring that individuals will not face judgment based on their sexuality. While individual clergy and churches are now per permitted to perform and host same-sex weddings, 
The legislation protects the autonomy of local congregations. Clergy are not obligated to officiate, and churches have the right to decide their own policies regarding wedding and building use. Similarly, ordination will continue to be based on qualifications, um, like convictions of God's call to ministry, candidates, faith, moral character, spiritual disciplines, and commitment to leading the church with human sexuality no longer being a barrier. Sexuality will, no, will not automatically disqualify them. It's important to clarify that churches are not compelled to receive a gay pastor. As with any clergy appointment, a thorough consultation process will ensure compatibility between the church and the incoming pastor. As a church leader and a fellow United Methodist, I firmly believe that these decisions made at the General Conference encourage us to widen our circle of Christian love, focus on fulfilling our mission, which is to make disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world, and to move forward as a loving community. I acknowledge there are still disagreements and many different opinions among us on all of these topics, but please let's be reminded that we have been and shall continue to be the church together because what unites us is bigger than what differs us. I believe you share with me such commitment in promoting unity and not division. My prayers are with you and for you. May the boundless love and glory of God shine through the missions and ministries of our cherished United Methodist Church, inspiring us all to walk in faith and unity. Yours in Christ, DS Peace Kim. So that's our, our district superintendent reporting on that. If you have any questions about what general conference determined, some of the things that are, are, um, are quite um, big issues, there will be impacts, um, but I, I am really happy to say that they ended the conference, even though the United Methodist is now about a quarter smaller than it was about a year ago. Um, a number of, of congregations have left the, left the denomination because of disagreements over some of those issues I read about. That means there's been a tightening of the budget. That means there are fewer bishops in the coming years than there have been in the past. That means there are some impacts with that. The General Conference did some hard work over the last couple of weeks, as well as celebrating what they did for welcoming all kinds of folks into, into the fellowship. But no matter whether it was something celebratory or something that was difficult th for them to do, they did it in a spirit of unity and hope and joy. All the reports I was getting back from our delegates there is that not in their experience, not in their memory, has there been a general conference that has been as hopeful and as loving and gracious as this one has been. I believe that's an inspiration for us in as we move forward. And so we'll talk about that some more as we have time to eat, because we're going to eat. So of course we have time to do that. So um, with that all said, I want, um, let's stand up for the benediction. And before we say the benediction, I'm going to pray for the meal that we're about to eat. Our gracious God, bless the food that we eat. Bless the, the beverages that we drink. And bless the time that we get to share together. We are already blessed because you are our God and we get to be your people. And so, Lord... We are here before you, and we are leaving this place in a, in a bit, whether right now or in, a, in an hour or so, to go be your people in the world. We pray that we will do that as we join together. Beloved family, may God bless us with the strength to love one another as God loves each and every one of us, that we may find the complete total and everlasting joy that comes when we abide together with God who is love. Amen. Let's sing Let There Be Peace on Earth in response to that. Yes, we do.
Well, 